Thank you. As Peter and Miga gave in their uh, talks, uh, multilingual education is possible. Integration is possible. So I'm not a practitioner, so I'm probably too lazy for that. So I'm mostly doing theory. And uh, what I'm going to talk today is just to look how much different settings, different contexts, different uh, ethnolinguistic uh, configurations affect the way how integration works, how successful it could be or not be. And certainly, as we have seen uh, from this morning's presentations, we are living in the time of, of great change. So something which used to be pretty stable for maybe 100 or 200 years is now going to change. So we have lived for long in the framework of nation states with a relatively little kind of immigration or kind of movement uh, between the states. Now, 21st century has changed it, and that change is going to be um, long, and it is going to be last. So that also means that maybe we should uh, think about some assumptions which we have had for a long time about education, about integration, and about identities altogether. Oh, maybe even about uh, human nature. These things which worked for 200 years might not, perhaps might not work as well in, in our change situation. And most of my today's talk is just to try uh, to find and question these things which, which we have as, uh, assumed and then see how they affect um, education and um, and um, inclusion, cohesion, and achievement. So all three things are important uh, for society. We need to kind of uh, aim towards all of these three, and we need to do it uh, in our current world, which is a globalized world. So I, my first part of my uh, talk is uh, about these assumptions, and the second part is going to look and, at the education more in a, in a more detail. So first, um, yeah, what we have assumed, or pretty much, is uh, what Rousseau has said already, I mean, the end of 18th century. Man is naturally good, and that it is from these institutions alone that men become wicked. So it is this kind of belief that society corrupts uh, a person. So the power, institutions, everything is kind of corrupting that initially moral and kind person when the person is being born. Much of our morality is based on, on that assumption. Oh, that little thing as um, if somebody does something bad, then we usually like to excuse it, at least to a degree, when we know how hard has been the life of that person, how society or whatever has mistreated that person. So that is part of that assumption too. Of course, human rights are also based on this assumption. So if humans are naturally good, then, of course, they should all have rights, because they are good. And our educational ideals are also based on, on that assumption, that uh, students are good. They want to learn, and they want to achieve. And the less there are any coercion in the same way, as, as Rousseau says here, the better are the results. Now, what if this assumption that man is, or human, is naturally good, is wrong. It could be wrong, because there are philosophical traditions who have said human nature has both good side and bad side. And of course, we can argue that if human nature is good, why we haven't achieved the paradise already? Why, why, why we still speed at the, at the roads 
Even though we are educated, we are moral people, we still tend to sometimes overspeed or do some trans transgress uh, against the rules. So it, maybe we are both bad and good. And if we are both bad and good, so these assumptions are not kind of totally accurate. Because of course we are bad and we are good. But, but assuming that we are only one of it uh, makes a, a tiny little kind of mistake, which is not huge because otherwise it would have been seen or visible already 100 years ago or, or, or more. But it is a small kind of mistake, a really small mi a mistake which didn't perhaps maybe come out in earlier centuries because that kind of belief worked together with a very strong kind of Christian base. Now that Christian base is fading away, and that belief is left alone. And maybe now it is starting to work against what it worked for before. Okay, and when we look at the education, what we, what we see in our um, society, the Western society, is that somehow, particularly in late modernity, at that time when we are working right now, that uh, uh, the person is a realization of the true self. So there is something inside us which needs to con come out. And we shouldn't kind of um, coerce a person into some kind of a norm because the self has to come out. But yeah, actually, if we are going to educate, or we, if we stop every education, there won't be any self coming out, because a human person only develops in the society. So all socialization, in some sense, is oppression. It is socialization into norms. And while you socialize a person into a norm, it is a kind of coercion. So learning itself is self-oppression in that sense. Because, of course, you have freedom to learn or not to learn. But to learn, you have to say, I have to learn. And that, again, is not choice anymore, but a kind of duty. You have to learn to, be, to become learned. So learning is a self-oppression, too. So we should think whether any oppression is uh, bad in itself. And if we think in, in that sense, we should also rethink some things in our assumptions about education, too. So individual and society. So I, I think um, I go uh, quickly about that. But human rights, which is also part of that discourse, gives a sense of entitlement. It is always on the side of the person uh, against the structures and the society. So when human rights work together with the great base of Christianity, it, it all works well. But when this base is lost, then it starts to create something else. So human rights, I don't take me uh, wrong. So human rights is just one way of uh, expressing certain very important values. And I say these values, human dignity, is that what humanity should stand for. But there are different narratives, so if you please, how you could express these values. And maybe human rights at the moment is not the best way to do that. But OK, that's something to think of. So what I would like to say is that we shouldn't let our moral compass to mislead us into dystopia or utopia or somewhere uh, bad. So we should be critical to our moral standing too, to step aside and think how, what is important and what does it mean. And now uh, I go to this inclusion and achievement and cohesion. Of course, it is the more inclusive you are, the, uh, the uh, more it will harm achievement, in a sense that everybody... Look, imagine if, if there are very different people with very different uh, uh, abilities in one room with the same resources, it is certain that the way how people are going to learn is affected by that inclusion. So that should be uh, taken uh, into account if we want to achieve both inclusion and both academic achievement. Uh, so <coughs> uh, 
one, some theories which have been in multilingual education, like translanguaging, where uh, students could use their home languages in the classroom. That might work well uh, in a classroom which has two groups uh, who know some of each other's language and teacher knows as well. But if the number of languages will increase when there are 15 languages in the classroom and that translanguaging uh, approach is allowed, then teacher is often ex excluded. Uh, from what's going on in the classroom, and I don't think that's good. Uh, so, uh, if you look at cohesion and inclusion, is that uh, if we maximize cohesion, kind of common values, we, we try to kind of um, make a, one cultural type out of the students, then of course it will affect uh, uh, inclusion. Uh, so, uh, and vice versa too, if we increase, um, uh, if we increase inclusion, it will affect uh, cohesion, because if everybody is included, then every kind of value set uh, is accepted equally uh, with, uh, as, as the others. And then cohesion certainly uh, is going to suffer. So you need some unity uh, within diversity, otherwise there will be only diversity, which uh, will uh, certainly affect cohesion. So. <clears throat> In the Estonian setting, that's uh, uh, something we have here. We have a kind of, his for historical reason, educational system which work for cohesion within the subgroups of the society, within Estonian-speaking and Russian-speaking groups. So, and that's what you have when you work for cohesion on ethno-linguistic group level. You, you might get a society, or a kind of parallel society, where two ethno-linguistic groups uh, work uh, in a different um, kind of cultural spaces. And um, uh, let's uh, go further. Cohesion and achievement, they are kind of in a kind of dia dialectic too. So if you maximize for cohesion, it is certainly reduces individuality. And by reducing individuality, uh, peak or creative performance as, as well. So which means if you push every, everybody down to accepted truths and uh, there is only one way to understand things and that's how a teacher says, then it's certain that it will affect those who think differently or might achieve something uh, creative. So in some sense, the Estonian educational system is um, uh, pretty cohesive in, in these two branches because our PISA tests show that uh, we have a quite high average in the world kind of comparison, but uh, not many top performance. So the kind of top is pushed down. And of course, we don't have many laggards as well, uh, because it, it works for the average and for cohesion. So it might be partly to the, uh, this. And now, um, if you are going to optimize for all these parameters, it is uh, clear that Academic or language ability, lower or higher, depends on whether you focus, how much do you focus on inclusion or exclusion. The more exclusive uh, educational system you have, the more you can have the high top peak, but it is the, the very exclusive, uh, certainly. The more inclusive you have, uh, it is certain that it will discriminate against those who couldn't um, develop their potential uh, into full because they have to, they, they don't get the attention that they, uh, they deserve. Or if you uh, look for cohesion, it is the same. The more cohesion, it will cut down the top performance. The less cohesion, it is beneficial for academic um, uh, achievement. So all these three parameters need to be uh, optimized, but the optimization, there is no I think there is no one single solution for every society how it does uh, or should work. And um, now that's the final uh, uh, slide here. And uh, there are a few, a few typical settings with a kind of uh, clarification how, how it would work or what would be a, a good or optimum um, kind of balance between these parameters. So, a setting where you have low ethno-linguistic diversity. It is a basically a nation-state situation, maybe 50 years ago, where there's a 
really well integrated national majority with a few immigrants uh, coming in. So for in, in, if you have this kind of settings, so the top students should get a kind of extra time for them. The rest should be really inclusive to let the a few, um, few kind of um, uh, uh, students who are different to integrate uh, uh, less and um, don't to focus too much on cohesion, because the small number of minorities will integrate if they are not pushed. Uh, if you have two large ethno-linguistic groups, so in, in that sense you should kind uh, uh, focus on inclusion to, to make contacts between these groups, which tend to be kind of focusing into their own uh, uh, in-groups. Uh, you should uh, have focus on average cohesions, kind of try to work towards uh, this, and, uh, and have the extra opportunities for strong and weak. So basically, translanguaging is uh, the way how to go in, in that kind of situation. So in basically, if, if I would think about the Estonian situation, a kind of uh, uh, school like Annelina school, or a school where there are two groups presented, uh, and the work goes uh, uh, so that the both, both groups, ethno-linguistic groups, are present uh, and in bilingual way, that would perhaps be the best setting for, for this kind of um, uh, um, uh, society. If you have large majority and large ethno-linguistic diversity, let's say 50% of the majority, and then the rest are kind of 20, 30, or who knows how many, um, uh, uh, other ethno-linguistic groups. So at that situation, yeah, the majority should aim at the cohesion to, to try uh, to uh, include at the same uh, time uh, those uh, students and to integrate them and to make extra opportunities for the strongest and the weakest for, for all, uh, all classrooms. And the last is where you have large and linguistic diversity and no majority. Now, basically, I would say that's the situation which you would see in London right now, uh, and um, soon uh, in, in many more places. Uh, so you should have focus on strong cohesion. But then, if you don't have a common value system, so as uh, you, you said, so you, you should uh, aim towards some unity uh, within diversity, but if there are not no kind of agreed uh, value set, so we don't actually know what kind of value set emerges in that construction process and becomes the new dominant uh, uh, value system. But I'm sure that will happen, but I'm not sure what would be the new uh, value system uh, after that kind of construction processes. So I stop here. And thank you.